What I'd like to do now is introduce our, our second speaker, Catherine Negus. Uh, Catherine has the quite interesting challenge of, of helping the Mental Health Foundation work out what we mean by well-being. So, Jason, you've touched on the fact that there is, you know, there, there are definitions out there. There's not necessarily a consensus. Um, I, I don't. I mean, I've had the privilege of, of, of working with Catherine just very briefly. Or, or, and, and seeing some of the initial exploratory work she's done in this space. Um, so, but I, I for me, it, it sits really absolutely alongside your presentation. We need to constructively and deliberately think about what we mean by well-being and, and by implication by mental health. And I, I think it's just not easy. Uh, and when something isn't easy, what I like to do is opt out and ask someone else to do it on our behalf. And, and Catherine has started doing some really, really exciting work in this space. Uh, and so um, Catherine is now going to talk to us a little bit about different models of well-being. I'm really, really excited to be here. I think this is the first totally in-person presentation I've done in about three years. So, um, yeah, as David says, we have been coming at this from quite an organisational perspective rather than a purely academic perspective conscious of the fact that we don't have a unified definition of well-being as an organisation and in fact probably don't have one of mental health either. We have copy-pasted versions of other people's definitions of those things which aren't necessarily things that sit well together. It gets used in different ways by different teams and we're starting to unpick some of the important implications of not using that language as carefully as we should. So um, it's definitely a work in progress. Um, I've been working on it for about five months so far, so a bit of brief literature review, looking into what's out there about the concepts already and looking at some of the major organisations, so the WHO, WEMWEBS, what works for wellbeing, NEF, etc. Um, trying to distill those into models, because I think while there are lots of papers out there about the ins and outs of arguments for and against different models, there I've not yet come across something that puts together all your different options for these models together and tries to pass out the distinctions between them in a consistent way, so that's what we're trying to start with. Um, also done some qualitative work with OPEN, which is our personal experience network. It's an online community of people interested in our work who are interested in contributing their views. Not totally scientific, it's a sort of convenience sample, but it was some work that was done for another project and it seemed like too good data to waste, so I've been looking at that as well. And also just asking colleagues to give their own personal interpretations, because while we don't have an organisation interpretation, we might have our personal ones. Um, and then most recently we held an internal roundtable asking our colleagues to look at this question from different lenses from their work, um, but also bringing personal experience into it. I found Quite interestingly, when I'm feeling well, I have a totally different perspective on some of the questions from when I'm not feeling well, so that's useful to know. Um, so starting off looking at existing definitions and models. Uh, so beginning with definitions of well-being, which then get fitted into models of the relationship between well-being and mental health. Um, I think quite a few articles tend to structure this around some of the ancient Greek concepts of hedonia and eudaimonia, so, which I was talking to a friend about last night in, from the hiking world and equated to what we call type one and type two fun. So type one, <laughs> type one is what you enjoy and type two is what you didn't really enjoy, but looking back on it, you're quite glad you did it anyway. So I think that's how things tend to get arranged in a lot of the literature. And possibly back in ancient Greece, they might have aligned more with these first two concepts on the list, so feeling good and functioning well. I think the way they tend to get used nowadays doesn't align completely with those two things so neatly. I think we tend to talk about feeling good in the sense of hedonic feelings, um, so joy, getting pleasure in the moment, but we do also talk about eudaimonic pleasure, so the idea of getting a feeling of fulfilment or a feeling of your own self-value. Whereas functioning well is more about the idea of uh, growth and uh, fulfilment as a value in itself rather than because it generates a feeling, if that makes sense. So there's those two concepts which to some extent overlap with hedonic and eudaimonic. Um, obviously quite a lot of definitions merge those two, so particularly in positive psychology the idea of flourishing combines both feeling good and functioning well. 
and that's what's being built off for things like WebWeb's the next position. Then there are longer and more specific elaborations on those topics. So I think that can maybe become a little bit of a laundry list approach sometimes. It's more culturally specific, so it might include things like autonomy, optimism, um, believing that society is going in the right direction, which some people say are fundamental definitions, but I think they do contain value judgments that aren't so absolute. Then the next definition, a balance between our challenges and resources. This one's a very slightly less often mentioned, but a really interesting one. So this is the idea that we require challenges as well as resources, and that finding the balance between those two things is what gives us a sense of well-being, which might be called flow for some of them. And then the final one is how we're doing overall well-being as a kind of catch-all term, not exactly a definition, but a, an umbrella for how we're doing as individuals, communities, and a nation, that's the ONS one, um, and containing various domains, which awkwardly includes personal well-being, just to complicate life. So that's a whistle-stop tour of some of the definitions. Um, then fitting these definitions into models, just to be clear, these are models of the relationship between mental health and well-being. They're not models of well-being and they're not models of mental health and it's determinants, it's just of that relationship. It's a very simplified collection. It's the slipperiest thing I've ever worked on. I think if you change one label, it can give you a whole other model. If you change one definition, it can give you a whole other model. So yeah, it's tricky. Um, but I've tried to put the models in ways that highlight some key distinctions. So which definitions of well-being fit into those models? What other definitions are required besides well-being in order for the model to stand up? So in particular, we initially put the idea of mental illness as out of scope for this particular piece of work, but I'm really struggling with that because I'm not sure it's possible to do it without defining everything. Um, and then finally, two key interacting questions, which would be whether there is such a thing as mental health separate from the absence of mental illness, if we think that exists, and secondly, whether health, however we're defining it, is the same thing as well-being, and I'll put a little diagram later about that one. Um, from our discussions, we came to the conclusion fairly early that we shouldn't expect the models to be mutually exclusive. We might find that one fits inside another, or they coexist quite happily, um, but they're never going to fully capture complexity. So, I've got five models to talk through, recognising that there are millions out there. First one, as soon as we discussed at our round table, we universally rejected it, but it is probably the way that we most often talk about wellbeing as an organisation, including in communications with the public. And that's just that mental health and wellbeing are the same thing, they're interchangeable terms. Um, don't need to say too much about that one at this point, but remembering that that is often how the public understand it, the media understand it, and we have used it. Secondly, um, well-being as optimal health beyond the absence of illness. You'll be familiar with this one from the World Health Organization. And I think important to clarify that this is not necessarily a spectrum. In fact, it's almost the opposite of a spectrum, because saying that there is something beyond absence of illness implies that there are quite clear dividing lines between those different states. It's not a continuous line. Um, definitions of well-being that this fits with, there can be many, um, but the one that's most often used is the functioning well one. So from the World Health Organization, um, it's about realizing abilities, coping with stress, working, making a contribution to our community, which starts to introduce some of the idea of the value judgments that are implicit in these. Um, this one does require us to have a definition of illness in order to make any sense at all. Model three, two intersecting spectra, and these are more like genuine spectra. So again, it's a model that defines health as something separate from the absence of illness, um, but this time it sees more interactions between those two, and there are more different places on the scale where a person, an individual could be. Um, again, we need to define those two things separately in order for the model to make sense, and there are debates over how much there genuinely is a correlation or is not a correlation between the two, which I'll touch on a bit later. Um, probably also should say where, where this one includes well-being and poor well-being on a, a, a spectrum there. 
the elements that are usually included are again the feeling good, the functioning well, and quite a lot of the social and relational aspect of it can get worked into that one. Model four um, looks a lot more complicated, but this is one which doesn't define well-being in contrast to the absence of illness. It puts it more outside the sphere of health altogether, um, where well-being is fed into by all sorts of determinants, including our positive material, social, personal circumstances. It brings in physical health into the equation, and mental health is one of those things which feeds into that overarching thing we call well-being. This model feels quite different depending on whether we talk of well-being as something in itself, so that's the feeling good, functioning well, or whether we say it is just a catch-all term, it doesn't have a meaning of its, of its own. Um, also worth noting that, again, the what works for well-being, the ONS would include personal well-being as one of the contributors to overall well-being. I think this one also, if we did use this one as an organisation, we wouldn't necessarily have to immediately define mental health and mental illness, so perhaps it's a little bit of a cop-out, but that's something that will come up later down the line. And then finally, Model 5. This one I've not come across so much in the literature, and I'm trying to find out if anyone has done more of it. It was an attempt by our team to work on that balance idea of well-being, so as a the sweet spot between challenges and resources, and think about where mental health and mental illness might fit into that. In our round table, we then decided there might be some problems with the way we've done this, but the idea was that the challenges might include mental illness or ill health, and the resources might include our mental health. So that's how we were thinking about that. Um, okay, again, requiring definitions. So those are a summary of the models I've come across from the literature. This was an attempt to see if there are gaps um, in terms of how the literature is looking at the concept versus how, in quotes, real people, because academics aren't real people, um, are thinking about it. So this was a free text question that went out to our open network uh, last summer, actually, just asking them simply, what does good mental health mean to you? That was all it was. So doing a, did a taxonomy. And the taxonomy did change based on the reading I was doing about the other models out there. So it is influenced by that. That was interesting to see where the overlaps were. Um, you can see on the left, there's quite a lot of interpretations that were about feeling good and functioning well. So what we might call well-being, a lot of our mem members were talking about as good mental health. They don't necessarily see a distinction. When I re ran the survey with staff, staff were much more likely to talk about functioning well than feeling good. So that was interesting. Um, but then a key distinction is other people who responded didn't talk about feeling good and functioning well. They talked much more about the underlying psychological abilities, approaches, the way we see our life. So things like um, emotional and cognitive regulation, being able to feel positive, not, not feeling positive, but being able to feel positive. Um, how we approach things like the moment versus the future, which I think is really interesting in terms of the hedonic versus the eudaimonic question how we think about ourselves, so it's sort of what I, I might be more likely to call mental health. Um, and then that interacts with our circumstances, so how we look at our challenges. Um, interestingly there, when people were talking about, some were talking about, it's all about staying on an even keel, being balanced, having emotions that don't go up and down too much, having thoughts that are quite you know, manageable, whereas other people talked a lot more about being in proportion to what you're experiencing. So if you are experiencing something negative, that you do actually experience that as something negative and having a full range of emotions. So it's quite a varied picture on how people see this. And then finally in the bottom, a uh, bit in orange shows, some people explicitly said it's the absence of mental ill health. Some people explicitly said it's not the absence of mental ill health. Mm -hmm. So that's a view from the public, um, as in not the public as a whole, but a fairly engaged public. And then, Secondly, ran a different survey with mental health foundation colleagues. We re-asked that question, so this time we were asking about mental health and well-being separately. Um, and this was the responses about well-being. I've highlighted the ones that I think are important because they've not necessarily been drawn out by the models from the literature. So the top left-hand corner, there was a lot about self-care and doing the things day-to-day -day that keep you well, so habits, um, 
lot of interaction with physical health as well. So people talking about having to do the physical things that then will keep your mind well. Um, it could be that we see that as the influence of media. And when I did a study on how positive mental health is presented in the media about a year ago, a lot of that was about wellness and well-being and what you can do to look after yourself rather than bigger questions. So that might be influenced by, by that, but it's important that that's how people see it. Um, what's that one? And another one at the bottom which came out a few times in that survey was well-being as translating our ability to thrive into actually thriving because we've got the positive circumstances that enable us to do that. Um, so finally, I think this might suggest some elements that are so far missing from the models in the literature. So particularly the idea that well-being might be something we do for our mental health, which we could discount as, oh, it's, it's sort of people trying to sell you something um, light and fluffy, but actually fits in quite well with a view that's developing, I think, of there being more of a two-way relationship between well-being and mental health. It's not just that your mental health leads to well-being, but that well-being also leads to mental health in that cyclical way. And that's something I've seen in some papers from the European Office of the World Health Organization. So they're not sticking with their old model. Um, and something that's probably not drawn out in the models explicitly as I've put them is the interrelationship between the determinants and mental health. So we were, we've been trying to consider these in a very practical way. What are the implications of those different models, not just as an academic exercise, but for an organisation? So we held a round table a few weeks ago and asked different colleagues to come um, with a different hat on. Um, these were some of the hats. So we had philosophical, so recognising we want our ideas to stand up coherently now and as the arguments develop in whichever way they're going to go. And also that these models are very much connected to how people see the roots of mental health and the roots of mental illness and therefore the solutions. The clinical and personal. Um, I can say from my own experience while doing this that I think understanding these things can have quite a transformative effect on people, how understanding of their own experiences and how we see those. Political. Um, we need to be mindful about the potential implications of the terms we're using. So mental health, mental illness, well-being can all be used in either liberatory or oppressive ways, depending on how we use them. And of course, they have implications for the sphere of action, different policymakers. Our action and mission, we need to know what we're trying to do as the Mental Health Foundation. Does that include well-being or not? If so, what does it mean? Um, and channel our resources more effectively in that direction. Communications, this is a major one, obviously. We need to be able to communicate our goals, but also it needs to resonate with people's own experiences and how they use language in real life, as well as tackling stigma. Um, I think stigma actually has a bigger part to play in a lot of this than we maybe give it credit for. It maybe accounts for why some of these terms are being used in ways that might not sit entirely with our philosophy. Uh, research and evaluation, which I'll talk about in a bit more in a minute, but we need to know what we're measuring when we evaluate different ways of preventing mental ill health, um, and that includes qualitatively. And I think when we choose what and how we're measuring it, we need to be sure it's not containing perverse incentives in any way um, and not shifting our focus in the wrong direction. And then finally, HR, so we want to be walking our talk, making sure our internal policies match up with this. I'm going to put that there because I'm <laughs> okay. So in starting to use those lenses, these were the two interacting questions I mentioned earlier. So is there such a thing as mental health separate from the absence of disease, if that can be defined? Um, just I'll keep it fairly brief because I'm sure you're familiar with the wide discussions on that one, but things we've been considering, for example, are is there a clear cutoff point for disease rather than a real spectrum? Um, do we want to expand a very traditional view of health and disease, which is focused on survival, reproduction, into things we value, such as the ab absence of suffering and human flourishing? If so, is that about health or is it about disease? Um, if we think about the rise of long-term conditions as a fairly modern phenomenon, that can shift our view of health and disease as well. So we might need to add more terms into the debate. And also, should there be a consistency with the way we look at physical health, where it's quite normal to say that a healthy person is experiencing physical illness, just 
for example, the words that get you got used a lot during the pandemic is a normally healthy person has caught COVID is dying of COVID. So that's, I think, a bit different from the way we tend to use language around mental health, which is perhaps to do with stigma again. The second question is mental health, however we define it, the same as well-being. I find this one one of the most fascinating bits because I think the political implications are massive. Um, there's a lot of literature explaining that feeling good is not necessarily the same as health. Um, examples all over the place, including um, some forms of mania and delusion, some dissociation, things that some people call toxic positivity, <laughs> substance abuse. Um, whereas negative feelings in response to a difficulty, we'd often call healthy, including grief, for example. Um, and that's in line with the idea of distress as a warning system that's telling us something useful. It's not unhealthy to be experiencing distress. I think some parts of the public do recognise that, even if the words get smooshed together. Um, functioning well initially does seem a bit more reasonable to equate with mental health. It seems a bit closer to how many people who've thought it through see it. Um, but at the same time, there are still a lot of value judgments involved in the idea of functioning well. It's changed a lot over history, what functioning well actually means, whether that's moral, whether it's about your economic value as a person. Um, so I think maintaining the distinction between mental health and well-being is important if we want to avoid using something that's very stigmatised to imply that people are wrong if they're struggling in a world that is in a pretty bad state. On the other hand, you could argue that accepting an unhealthy society has made people ill um, is a way of making that more, more valued. And it could be more in line with the way we talk about physical health. It could help to break down that stigma. So there's two kind of polar opposite ways of looking at it. I think deciding between them, we need to come to a better organisational understanding of what we mean by distress and what we mean by mental illness. So it kind of comes back to that point about you need all the definitions to make it work. Um, the way I've been thinking about it is I think there's a lot to do with balancing. So to do with balancing our short term needs and our long term needs. Hedonic happiness, eudaimonic happiness, individual needs, social needs, feelings, function. Getting all of those things right is something to do with where the sweet spot of mental health would be. Being able to do that and get that balance. Um, so those are two core questions that we, and I've, I've also tried to lay out some models on a grid and how those two interact. I won't go through all that now, but that's been quite useful in laying some of them down. Some of the other questions we've been discussing how do physical and mental health interact? And is that interaction what we mean by well-being? Where do the determinants of health and where does equality fit into each model? So the umbrella model and the balance model both have ready-made places for the determinants to sit, whereas some of the others you have to think a bit more about where we might put those. Does each model allow for different types of mental illness and different dimensions of mental health? Um, so the Linear model, as used by the World Health Organization, might stand up much better for things like depression anxiety. It's quite difficult to experience good well-being during a depressive episode, whereas we might see the two intersecting spectrum model as being much more relevant for something like um, what are called SMI, so schizophrenia disorders and so on, um, where it, it's much more common to have phases in each area. Um, another Related, I guess, question that came up during our discussion was that colleagues wanting a, a model that captures a dynamic picture of mental health, so not this idea that we all go on this scale for our lives where you just expect to move in one direction. Um, and people valued the balance model for that, the sense that you can be moving. Um, what does each model apply about specific experiences? So, can someone with serious mental illness have good well being? Is someone who's going through grief mentally unwell? When you start to unpick, some of those, it can be really productive. Um, how, at the bottom, how our definitions fit in with real life usage, because language is a living thing. We're not living in ancient Greece, but in 2022, things can adapt. And then I just wanted to mention that we'd said there were some issues we discussed about model five, which was the balance, where well-being is the balance, and you might have mental illness as a challenge and mental health a resource. We had a really interesting conversation on that one where saying that the idea of having to put someone's mental health or mental illness into one of those two categories is really difficult when we consider that a lot of those traits might be elements of human experience that in some circumstances are really useful and in other circumstances are not useful and what is it that 
takes them from one category into the other. Okay, final slide. Um, I am not an expert on measurement, and that's one reason I'm interested to be here and hear thoughts on that one, but this does obviously lead us to some questions about that. Um, some initial thoughts. There are kind of, there's a range of well-being measures, so there are abstract, feelings-based measures, which are, can be just one question sometimes, ranging through measures that look at people's feelings about different areas of their life, their relationships, their housing, and so on. And then there are the mixture measures, which are both subjective and objective. I think using different measures does suggest different scope for the models. Studies have tended to talk about whether well-being measures correlate with diagnostic measures. So some of the proponents of the two interspe intersecting spectra model um, argue that positive and negative effect quota only moderately negatively correlated, which is kind of the opposite of the argument that some of the well-being measurement scales like WEMWEBS would correlate with tools like um, the GAD and PHQ, so saying that you can actually have a point on the WEMWEBS where it would trigger an assessment for depression or anxiety. So two contrasting views there. Um, finally, if wellbeing and mental health are separate, um, can we measure mental health at all? Do we have to use wellbeing as a proxy? Um, if so, what does that imply about what we think is an organisation? Can it lead to in kind of perverse incentives to be, for example, heavily focused on things like individual resilience, so that people can feel better in a society that's not necessarily working well? Um, or is it more about focusing on, for example, enabling people to function well in a way that helps us to change that society? So that feels quite deep and meaningful, I like that. So that's where we finish. <laughs> Thank you.